we're a military family, so he is gone a lot and has been throughout the course of our marriage. So how we've found that is the best way currently for us to engage with the Bible is we use the YouVersion Bible app that has an online reading plan. So we just chose a Bible plan to read together and currently we're reading the Bible chronologically in a year. And the cool thing about it is it gives us daily readings each day that we work through. But then at the end of whatever the daily readings are, there's a line that says, talk it over. And so we can write down just quickly like, oh, this, this thing was really interesting today, or I was challenged by this, or I found this intriguing, or do you have thoughts on this? And when I write it in, it actually sends him a notification and an email that, hey, Holly made this comment and he can read it right there. And then he can reply back. The fact that um, we're walking through something together and that the organization is figured out and that, hey, there's an agreement on, we're reading this and this is what we're doing today. And if you get behind, you just kind of try to get caught up. That has helped us tremendously uh, be intentional about staying consistent with it, that just kind of haphazardly going through in the past has never been useful <laughs> or never worked out. Yeah. So uh, it, just having that organization and that accountability with the other person has, has uh, been a game changer. If you don't know, you won't grow. If you don't know, you can't grow. And we're going to talk about what that means this morning. We're in our series, Ultimate Truth, in a relativistic world. And I was thinking about the word truth this morning. I'm in the shower. I have some of my best thinkings in the shower. I wish all the stuff I thought of in there didn't fall out when I get out of the shower. But I thought about the word truth and the way it gets tossed around these days, right? So you can get a bunch of people in a group saying, I have a truth. Oh, really? You have one? I have my own. And I have one. And if you line 10 people up, you might get 10 different versions of what truth means. I have my truth, like it's mine. But here's the rub. You could line 10 people up who each say, I have a different truth. And they can all be wrong, but they cannot all be right. So we know, and we believe, and we teach because we believe it with all our hearts, this is truth. God's holy word is filled with truth. It isn't a feeling. It's truth. When people say, I have my own truth, they're really saying, I have my own belief. We get to use the word truth for the scripture. So we're going to talk about today how this book, this book can help you have surgery that heals the soul. Among the many things, we've already learned that this book, God's word, tells us who we are, right? We're, we're adored. God delights in us. He loves us. We're a masterpiece, and we're broken, and we need him. It's also showed us how we can be rebuked when we need to be, and we have to take that in, and, and we can be challenged. Well, today we're going to look <clears throat> a little deeper into how it can do surgery that heals your soul. You ever have this kind of conversation with people? Uh, there's a group of you, you've done a little something at work, for example, you spent two or three hours, and you're working, and you're done, and it's lunchtime, and you're hungry. So somebody says, man, let's go get sushi. And I would say, of course, let's go get Mexican food. <laughs> and then somebody looks straight at you and says, you know, Dennis, there's five of us, let's take your car. And I'm going, m -m 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 my car? Because here's what I'm thinking, I'm frozen, Right? I know that I was going to clean the car Saturday, and I didn't. <laughs> and we did stop at Taco Bell on the way home from the Bay Area. I meant to throw this stuff out, and I shouldn't have taken the nap and watched a football game. I wonder if there's some way I can race home and just race through the car and just quick, do a quick job on it. I'm, I'm even thinking, you know, I know your car's only a three-seater, but we could put five in it. <laughs> All this is happening in a microsecond. You know why? Because my car looks like And see, they don't know it looks like that. I do. 
It's like when your house is a mess. Nobody who, anybody who comes in your house might see, but if nobody has come in, they don't know the state of your house. But you see, God doesn't show up for surprise inspections. He always sees, always knows what's going on inside and what's going on in our life. So as we walk through scripture, the beauty and the wisdom found in God's word, this morning we're going to look through Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16. If you have your Bibles with you, follow along. If not, we're going to have it on the screens. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper. See the emphasis? It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. We learned weeks ago that confidence means with faith. With confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What is the writer of Hebrews telling us in these verses? He's saying that the Holy Scriptures do many things in our life, many powerful, important, wonderful things, but something else they do is if we allow it, they examine us deeply. They take us within. They shine the light in every corner if we, again, allow it. You see, God knows everything about us already. He wants us to come clean with it so that he can give that grace and that mercy that he promises. Pastor John Piper described it like this. He said, one of the functions of the word of God when it comes into us is that it penetrates very deep, like a sword, like a sword through tough, hard layers and makes judgments about what's there. And I kept looking at that word, sharper than, sharper than. It's a comparative term. It was the sharpest thing in the ancient world, this sword, because to cut right through ligaments, bone, and marrow. And I thought, what is so sharp today it could do the same thing? And I thought of the scalpel. The scalpel is used in the medical field for surgery. So I, I checked out, what, is, what would the definitions of the use of a scalpel be? And I'll share those with you. It says here, the use of a scalpel or the, or the function of surgery is a medical specialty that uses operative manual and instrumental techniques on a patient to investigate or treat a pathological condition such as disease or injury to help improve bodily function or appearance or to repair unwanted ruptured areas. Now, the John, Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School goes on to say, Further, surgery is to explore the condition for the purpose of diagnosis. It may remove or repair disease tissues or organs or remove an obstruction. So I want to look at the list of the seven things we have there in those definitions and see how the Bible lines up with those seven things. The objectives of surgery are investigate. You're looking, you're checking and seeing. Then explore, which means going somewhere you haven't gone before. So you're you're charting new territory with the the scalpel, doing the surgery. To do what? So that you could diagnose and then treat. Diagnose and treat. The diagnosis should give you the proper course to follow in the treatment so that there can be improvement. It's to improve the condition and repair the problem or remove an obstruction. So I kept thinking about, man, that's, that's incredible what surgery does. Many of you here have had surgery. I had surgery on my knee twice. I got plastic parts inside this ear, maybe in the rest of the head. I don't know. <laughs> Some people might guess that. Man, he's got plastic everywhere up there. So, 
But we have surgery, and for me, the surgery was needed because it had to improve a medical problem. So sharp, sharp, sharp. And I thought about sharp. Years ago when I lived in Pleasanton, I lived in the Stone Ridge townhomes. And I came home one day, and there's a guy, one, one uh, uh, townhome over washing a boat in front of his house with the garage open. He's going in and out of the garage. And I'm thinking, this is weird because he doesn't live there. I know who lives there. What's he doing there? So I pull over because I want to know. I say, hey, who are you? Do you live here? What are you doing? Where are the people that used to live here? He goes, we were on an exchange for a year. They're back in England. I said, oh, what do you do? He is a director of a culinary institute in the Bay Area, trained at the New York Culinary Institute and an avid fisherman. So I got to know this guy, Chef Paul. He still is director of that culinary institute. And in getting to know him, I learned a lot about food, especially fish and cooking. So he would cook in our house every two or three weeks for the next two years. I got this guy in my kitchen. I'm watching. I'm going, this food's incredible. How do you do it? What are the most important things? Give me two. He was from New York. He goes, Dan, Dan, listen. Pay attention. <laughs> two things. Watch this. Take a look at this. He has this leather case, and he unfolds it, and there's the knife. They're old and worn and razor sharp. You ever meet a chef who doesn't take his own knives somewhere? There's a reason for that. So he says, number one rule, sharp knives. Okay, I never forgot that. Number two, he goes, number two, look in your spice drawer. Throw this out. Any spice over six months old is useless, unless you don't care what you eat. That was his policy. That was a bonus tip for you. So I'm thinking about this dull knife thing because in fishing, I learned something else. We're catching all this fish and I'm kind of embarrassed when I catch it by myself. Nobody taught me how to fillet and I didn't have a, a good fillet knife. So I'm, I'm filleting a fish and it just gives me little globs of fish. And I'm going, well, this is overrated. I thought they said these things gave a lot more fish. I didn't know beans, Paul taught me. So then I'm thinking about sharp and I'm thinking, what if, what, what if you tried to cut this? with a dull knife. Okay, you got to work. At this point, most of you get the bread knife out, don't you? (laughs) You see, it doesn't cut well. And here's the, see, it just goes like, and here's the secret. This is a true story. A dull knife is far more likely to injure you in cooking than a sharp knife. Notice the blade. Ta-da. Because if you use a dull knife, it's a lot like this. Watch this. Psych. You were thinking you were going, he isn't gonna, is he? I thought about it. Another story about the knife. There we are at a pastor's retreat at Lake San Antonio eight, nine, ten years ago with the whole staff or most of the staff. And I love to cook at these retreats. I'm making a frittata in the kitchen using what? Dull knives. It's like they've been sawing wood with these things. So I'm hacking away on something, and I'm looking at everybody from the staff is outside on the piano, the patio that I can see, and they're singing, worshiping, and all that. And I'm, I'm making food, and I go, ah! And I cut the tip of a finger off. I'm not going to show you which one it is. If I showed you, it wouldn't go well. It's that finger. So I cut it off, right? What am I going to do? I don't want to interrupt the mood and the flow. So I get a bandage. It's just bleeding like crazy. And then I did what any guy would do. I got duct tape. I literally did. I duct taped the whole thing up. I left it on there for three weeks because it worked, because it wasn't bleeding. Three weeks later, I pull it off. It's like it happened a second before. My daughter says, call Rick, my friend, Dr. Rick. Get him over here. And he came over to bless me by saying, what an idiot. So how does scripture do the same thing as a sharp knife? How does sharper than a double-edged sword work? It works because just like this really good knife, it allows the user to be accurate, to do what I'm designed to do, to do what should happen. That's what the sharpness of God's holy word is designed to do. One scholar put it this way about the power of God's word to do this among many things. He said, 
The Bible is living and powerful. I'm gonna hold this up while I say this because you just gotta look at this. Understanding the spiritual nature of the Bible, the writer of Hebrews could confidently write this. The Bible is not a collection of old stories and myths. It has inherent life and power. So if you're sitting there thinking, this pastor has life and power, you are mistaken. This is where the power is. That power's there. If I'm way over here, the power is still there. And it's for anybody who picks it up and allows it to speak to them. That's what it is. I'm just sharing what's here. And anybody can use this beautiful, wonderful gift from our Lord and have the power that comes with it. So I want you to know that the Bible is alive and it gives life to anyone, anyone who receives it with faith. Hebrews 4, the verses that we read, goes on to say that everything is laid bare before the eyes of whom we must give account. And the term there in its original uses, use was the term used for when the priest in the temple was doing a sacrifice, would prepare the animal and lay it bare and get it ready for what was about to happen to make an accurate sacrifice to atone for a sin. We know that no one is hidden before God. He sees our heart and he knows how to touch it and we are accountable for how we are to respond to him. We cannot hide our thoughts or actions from God. It's not something we can. And God gives us an opportunity to examine our ways and respond according to his plan. You see, we have to see it as an opportunity because it's too easy to say, well, I can't let anybody see what's in here. I, I know a bunch of stuff is going on, going on and I have to decide whether or not I let God know about it. Are you kidding? He already knows. This isn't a process of God has to discover what's going on in you. It's like when you catch your kid at doing something, you know they did it. You're just wondering, are they gonna lie to me about it or are they gonna own up to it, right? And why do you want them to own up to it? Why do you not wanna have to pry it out of them? Because if they own it, they're gonna come before you and say, okay, what are we gonna do, mom and dad? Because I did it. I, 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 I shouldn't have and I did. You know now that you have a kid who's gonna own something and you can work with that kid. You can teach him and help him grow, right? But if you gotta pull it out of them and if they're hiding and they remain hiding things in secretive, there's no growth opportunity yet. That's the power of this. We're a little bit like Adam and Eve in the garden, right? They were naked and it was fun, it was great. Caring for the garden and the serpent. And they, they only had to leave one tree alone. And the serpent says to Eve, well, that's ridiculous. You can have this. And so she takes the fruit, gives it to Adam. He eats it. And then they go, oh, we're naked. Ah, cover up. Then they hide. And God's walking through the garden. And he's saying, hey, where are you guys? He's not saying because he didn't know where they were. It's like, man, I can't find these guys anywhere. It wasn't that. He just said, where are you? Well, we're hiding because we're naked. He goes, how did you know you were naked? And brokenness came into the world. They made that mistake. The word uncovered in these verses comes from the Greek word trakalitso. And it's used only here in the New Testament. And here's what it means. It was a particular hold in wrestling that meant you grip the neck in a way that the person could not break the hold. And here's the usage in the book of Hebrews. Remember that Hebrews was written in part to encourage people about who Jesus is because there were people being pulled away from Jesus, people returning to Judaism, and, and the writer wanted to say, do you know who he is? And what he's really saying in these verses is, when, G when you're with him and you go away, it's not like, oh, he won't know where I'm going. He has a hold on you when you give your heart to him. He has a hold on you. The word of God discovers and exposes our condition. I think of Alcoholics Anonymous, step four. Step four is a beautiful step, but it's a tough step. It says, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And some people look at step four and say, well, step four is when, what you do when you want to get sober. No, it isn't. If you hit step four, you already are sober. Your sponsor would never do step four with you if you were still drinking or using. So it isn't to not drink and not use drugs. You know what it is? It's to expose and bring into light all the other junk down in there that's part of living that way. You can't just take the substance out and say all is good. You've got to look at all the other behaviors and the thinking styles and everything that came with it. It's got to be brought to the light. And that is tough. God doesn't do this to humiliate you 
and expose you and make you less than everyone else and, and tell you you're inferior. But it can feel like that, can it? It can feel so raw and so vulnerable. But in the AA process, they know if you don't cough it up with somebody and experience that person's acceptance and love of you, even as they hear the garbage, you're going to have trouble knowing how God loves you. You're going to have trouble knowing that even with this stuff inside, I am loved and acceptable, and the path to my Father is wide open to me because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's really, really important. Did you know that all the 12 steps and it came from scripture, from a Bible study back in the 30s. Every one of them are Bible-based and Bible-generated. It's God's word. So let's look at some of the scriptural scalpels, things we find in the Bible. Because these verses, when we look at them and take them seriously, they can do actual surgery, cut right through to our soul and open us up to the healing that God wants for us. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 40, let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. So that's interesting to me. Let us return. What's he saying there? Obviously, it's easy to drift away, isn't it? It's easy to drift away. And we may need to return to the Lord. And how do we do that? We examine our ways. I got to look at this. I don't do it one time. I got to keep doing this. In Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Nothing or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roof. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is out of God's view and sight. That's how important we are to him. And then we look in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. And when it says know you, it means we know every part of you, end to end, every aspect, every detail. That's kind of weird at first when you think about it and kind of freeing at the same time. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in and behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. And da David says this. This is amazing to me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. David is saying, Lord, I submit and accept you know more about me than I will ever know. And he trusts it. That's the trust we need for our Father. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Examine yourself, just like in Lamentations. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. In this last verse I read to you, Paul is saying, do a spiritual checkup. Do it regularly. Don't assume that because your routine is the same, you don't drift away. You're not tempted. You're good. We can't relax that. We have to remind ourselves daily. We need to do these spiritual checkups. I think of, well, well we're either going to grow closer to Jesus or away. To be in the middle doesn't really work because that's stagnant. Some of us were at the Dead Sea months ago. What a beautiful body of water. Stunning. Crystal clear. Gorgeous. And absolutely, completely dead. There isn't one living thing on earth that can survive in that lake. Nothing. There's no outflow, only an inflow. Think about a stagnant pond you may have encountered somewhere, that it's been this, this body of water slowly evaporating, but nothing comes in, nothing goes out. What does it have? Mosquito larvae, oil slakes, trash, junk is just attracted to it. It's stagnant. We can be at risk for that. We need to do a spiritual checkup. Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Church, in New York, City, New York City says, we must understand we're not okay, no matter what the okay book tells us. We need God's word to penetrate deep within, to show us our motivations, our fleshly desires, to reveal to us our sin and our cover-ups. But you know, it's not only 
our sins, cover-ups, and wrong motivations we need to accept and bring into the light. You know what else it's about? It's about what comes next. Say you invite the Lord. Okay, Lord, I'm gonna do this thing. I'm, gonna, I'm opening up. Show me. Show me what I have in here. Show me what you need to change. Show me where the transformation needs to happen. Then what is so important? First, commit to reading and studying God's word daily. We, we launched the 30-day Bible challenge a few weeks ago. You can start at any time now. And we still have these books for sale in the Connection Center. If you want to dig into the James study now, please do. Reading the Bible is wonderful. Studying is even better. You dive deep. You learn the meaning of words. You learn, learn the meaning of context. It just, it just gives it so much more. Please let yourself do it if you're not doing it now. Next, commit to prayer, not just to ask him for stuff. Now, I acknowledge in Philippians 4, it says, Paul says, rejoice always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. And everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So he does say right there, pray for everything. But prayer is so much more. Lord, be with me today. Guide and direct me today. Show me to me today. Where do I need to grow? Where do I need to strengthen? Where am I weak? Where do I need more grace and mercy today? Show me. Prayer is so big and so beautiful. Let yourself have more than just asking for things periodically. Third, ask the Holy Spirit to give meaning to what is revealed and a path to move forward. Jesus said in John 14, he said, I gotta go, guys, I'm leaving. Don't freak out because I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And then he says, the Holy Spirit is coming to remind you of what I've taught you and teach you all things. We can pray, we should pray and say, Holy Spirit, now that I've learned these things about me, my weaknesses, my broken parts, I hate it, but what does it mean? How do I move forward? And he will lead you forward. He will give you a path how to address what you find and how to grow and repair. How to do the seven things that medical surgery does to lead to the life that he has for you. Fourth, commit to being held accountable to one or more others with whom you share your findings and goals. I'm in a Thursday morning group with men from four other churches. I've been in it for over 14 years. I'll probably be in it till they drag me out of there, kicking and screaming. I need these guys. I teach Bible to guys two mornings a week in the peninsula room. There's a bunch of guys that come. But it's really not about, oh, what a great teaching. It's about they love being together, and we have a degree of accountability together. You saw in the video, at the start, or right before the message, the Hall family discovering how accountability works and blesses their marriage. Accountability is powerful. I'm so accountable. Accountable is ridiculous. But God knows me. He knows I need that. It's more like Dennis needs that. I better set up a bunch of groups for him or he is in such trouble. That's the truth. I'm grateful for that. And fifth, if there's an area or areas where you really struggle, find yourself running out of ideas and hope, reach out. Would you please reach out? We have a lay counseling ministry here. We have 13 trained lay counselors, nine women, four men. They meet in the care center, which is the lower room of the building next door that Shoreline owns, building number two for Shoreline. You can contact the church. All the information is in the Connection Center. We did 16 weeks of training, then four additional training with people selected to go further. This isn't a boast. This is just a fact. It's the most extensive training you'll find for lay counselors anywhere because we committed to it years ago. We felt the call to do that only because we want to help the hurting and the broken. And the people serving there have that same call on their heart. But what if it's more than that? What if it's something that really needs professional help? Don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. Reach out to us. Call, connect, email. We can refer you to people in the community that we know and trust, that are skilled and can help you with what you're dealing with. So don't do it yourself. Don't go it alone. You see, when the Bible says we're the body of Christ, and when we talk about community here, don't think of Sunday's community day. Night of worship is a once a month community night. We are a body. We are a community. 
We do life together. We pray for each other. When, when there's prayer after the service, come up. Ah, oh, come up. If you think you need prayer, we want to pray with you. We want to walk with you because we're going to need you to walk with us. We're doing life together. Please don't keep it to yourself. So I'm encouraging you to invite the Lord in to examine and look and take that step. Maybe have someone help you with it because it's so hard, but he has wonderful things for us with this incredible surgery that can heal the soul. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this morning because all these wonderful brothers and sisters in this room, Lord, are here because they either know you or are after you. Speak into our hearts. You know what's true about us. We don't hide anything for a microsecond. What a fantasy that is. You know all. You are omnipresent, omniscient, omnipowerful. Thank you, Father. So speak to us each, one by one. Anything that needs to come to light, let that happen so we can grow and get stronger. Be more like Jesus. Be more of what you've designed us to be as your masterpieces. I pray this for each one here and for all of us collectively. And I pray this in the name of the one who loved us best, Jesus Christ. And everyone together said, amen. amen. God bless. Hey, I want to let you know before you go, if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, we have a class for you after this service and the next service in the peninsula room. See, what we know is no matter what your talents and abilities are, the moment you receive Jesus into your heart, you also receive spiritual gifts. If you want to know what those are and you don't, go to that class. If you want prayer, please come forward. We will have people up here ready to pray with you. If you're new to the church, go into the Connection Center. Say, hi, I'm new. We got a gift for you. Ask any questions. If you just want to get connected somehow to ministry here, please go to the Connection Center. Now, if you all would stand before you go, I want to give you a word. As you leave today, please remember that the Lord God loves you enough to want the very best for you. And would you commit sometimes to just allowing him to do that surgery within to do what must be done. And then in the words of Paul, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless, have a great Sunday, and we'll see you next week.